Hi everyone. Continuing our discussion of pharmacodynamics and specifically drugs acting on receptors, let's now turn to drugs that tend to block the action of an endogenous or exogenous compound either through direct competition at the receptor or via somehow altering the receptor or in the case of inverse agonists by moving the signal transduction mechanisms in the opposite direction of that caused by agonists. The simplest to understand is the antagonist. Most of these drugs are considered competitive antagonists, which means that they compete with an agonist for binding to a receptor by mass action. From a clinical perspective, pure antagonists have no intrinsic efficacy of their own. However, their effect is seen by blocking the effect of an endogenous or exogenous agonist, pure or partial. Other terms we use for antagonists are therefore blockers or lytic drugs. For example, a beta-1 receptor antagonist is a beta-1 receptor blocker and is sometimes called a sympatholytic drug. Let's now take a look at the impact of a competitive antagonist on the effect of an agonist using the sigmoidal log dose response relationship we've discussed before. However, in this graphic, let's show the effect of the agonist alone seen with the solid line an agonist in the presence of a competitive antagonist, which is the dashed line. Looking again, we can see what it does. It shifts the agonist curve to the right, meaning that in the example shown, the EC50 or concentration of agonist is a hundredfold higher to get the same effect. The only documentable effect of a pure antagonist is seen by the reduction of the effect of the agonist, whether it be endogenous or an exogenous drug. So again, using the effect seen at the EC50, follow the arrow downward to the dashed line, you can see that the agonist effect would be reduced from 50%, since it's the EC50, to a negligible percent of the maximum. So while not all competitive antagonists have this high affinity, when they do, and concentrations of an antagonist are maintained, they almost appear irreversible because the available agonist cannot be administered in adequate amounts to compete with the antagonist. Now, if you recall, we also discussed the action of drugs via receptor theory. And in this case, the antagonist essentially binds with equal affinity to R, which is the resting form of the receptor, and R starred, which is the active form. So essentially, the conformational equilibrium between these two subtypes of the receptor are not affected. And so there will be essentially no effect on its own, but the drug will act as a competitive antagonist for both a full or a partial agonist. Now what do things look like when we turn to our bicycle analogy? Basically, a competitive antagonist behaves as if the chain has come off the gears. So interaction of an agonist can no longer lead to a biological effect, known as forward movement of the bicycle here. However, given alone, you never know if a pure competitive antagonist was present unless you tried to turn the pedals. And notice that the bicycle wasn't moving. Let's take a, a look at a different kind of antagonist, that is the so-called non-competitive antagonist, which either binds at a site away from where the agonist binds, but changes the receptor's ability to bind the agonist, or as shown here, binds the receptor and then covalently links to it, essentially preventing displacement by an agonist and appearing on the log dose effect plot to reduce Emax consistent with the reduction of available receptors. A small number of drugs are considered non-competitive antagonists. The best example of this type of drug used in veterinary medicine is the alpha-adrenergic receptor antagonist phenoxybenzamine, which is used most commonly for post-catheterization urinary spasms in cats. This drug interacts with the receptor and after a time covalently binds to it. The clinical relevance is that this takes some time for the drug to have its maximal action. However, once it, had it has its maximal action after several days, adding more agonists cannot compete with the drug and move it off of the receptor. So the maximal effect that can be achieved is reduced, just like you'd see with a lowering of receptor numbers. 
So only synthesis of new receptors will accomplish returning that maximal effect to pre-antagonist levels. Now there is also a drug class called agonist antagonist or mixed agonist antagonist. How does that work? This is a drug that is an agonist under some conditions and an antagonist under others, either other receptor or receptor subtypes or tissues. Here we show two receptor subtypes in the same tissue and location as if the receptor's subtype function were domains of a single receptor signal transduction system. In its role as an antagonist, this drug can also block the activity of other agonists. What are some examples of agonist antagonists? When acting differently, depending upon tissue, it might be called a selective receptor modulator. An example of this are called the selective estrogen receptor modulators, or SERMs. And examples of these include tamoxifen or raloxifene. In veterinary medicine, the best examples of agonist antagonist are the opioid drugs. Drugs that act as agonists at the kappa receptor and antagonists at the mu opioid receptor include pentazosine and nalbuphene. Butorphanol is also a pure kappa opioid receptor agonist, a partial mu opioid receptor agonist, and an antagonist at the delta opioid receptor which has been connected to the central nervous system pathways associated with opioid abuse. Now let's turn to drugs that can counter certain signal transduction pathways. Let's first introduce the cast of characters in order to understand what we're going to talk about. In order to understand how some drugs work, we need to understand that some receptors can be associated with a cellular effect even when they are not bound by an agonist. We call this activity above zero a constitutive rate of activity. Now in this context we have already learned about full agonists and we want to recognize that there are endogenous agonists or physiological agonists as well as exogenous agonists or drugs. Both of these types of agonists will increase the level of transduction in the system above basal an antagonist drug can block the effect of either type of agonist, but not affect the basal rate. Now we introduce a new type of agonist called the inverse agonist. It interacts with the signal transduction pathway, but it reduces the pathway's intrinsic activity. So these effects are best compared and summarized on this sigmoidal log dose effect plot. The first thing to notice is that we're now representing that 0% or basal activity is above zero, meaning that there's activity or constitutive activity when there's no drug bound. The endogenous or exogenous agonist increases the effect as we previously described. Using a pure competitive antagonist shifts the curve to the right as we also previously discussed. Now, notice with an inverse agonist, this also works in a concentration or dose-related fashion but it pushes the signal transduction rate below the basal or constitutive rate. Likewise, a competitive antagonist can shift the log dose effect curve of the inverse agonist to the right, essentially mirroring the patterns seen with a pure agonist with or without an antagonist. What does this all look like when we use our cartoon model of receptor theory? Well, the first thing we have to acknowledge is that when we have no agonist present of any sort, the receptor itself has some level of constitutive or basal activity. Then when we add an inverse agonist, it binds with greater affinity to R, shifting the conformational equilibrium towards R. When interacting with a system where the unligated receptor has constitutive activity, it serves to decrease the effect below constitutive levels, that is, it moves the effect in the opposite direction of a pure or partial agonist. Returning to our bicycle and gear analogy, we'd have to imagine that when the receptor was not bound by an endogenous or exogenous agonist, constitutive or basal receptor and transduction activity would be like a bicycle moving forward or perhaps downhill. Regardless, there's no need to pedal, that is, there's no need for drug effect to act uh, to drive the, the system forward. 
However, in contrast to a regular agonist, an inverse agonist would drive the receptor transduction system as if the pedaling slowed the bicycle. Note that when the inverse agonist is removed, the bicycle speeds up again to its constitutive or basal rate of speed. So what are some drug examples of inverse agonists? Firstly, they're usually seen in receptor systems where there's a constitutive level of activity, as we've said. An example is the GABA-A chloride channel. You might know that agonists like the barbiturates, phenobarbital, or the benzodiazepines cause membrane hyperpolarization and a calming effect. However, although not usually a clinical goal, the beta-carbolines are inverse agonists in this system that conversely lead to excitement. More commonly, some histamine receptor type 1 and some type 2 antagonists have inverse agonist activity. H1 antagonists or inverse agonists include pyrilamine, desloratadine, and levocetirazine. Other receptor systems include the mu opioid receptors and specifically drugs like the antagonists, naloxone and naltrexone, which exhibit an inverse agonist effect in the presence of a pure mu agonist, such as morphine. Finally, the cardiac drug, uh, normally known as a beta antagonist, carbidilol, uh, is another example that has low-level inverse beta adrenergic agonist activity. So I'd like to summarize the what we've discussed in the first two videos on pharmacodynamics in a graphical way. First of all, it's useful to use log dose effect curves to describe drugs interacting with receptors. Full agonists have, by definition, full intrinsic activity on the receptor, moving it fully towards the activated state. Partial agonists have less intrinsic activity and are not as efficient as full agonists at encouraging the active receptor state, and so they have a lower Emax. Pure antagonists have no intrinsic activity, favoring neither the active nor resting form of the receptor, but they can block either competitively, that is, in a concentration-dependent manner, the effect of an agonist, or non-competitively, either through an allosteric mechanism or sometimes covalent binding of the receptor. Agonists antagonists, or mixed agonists antagonists, not shown here, are drugs that interact with different but related receptors at different concentrations as agonists and also antagonists, usually on subtypes of the receptors in the same or different tissues. And finally, inverse agonists impact signal transduction so it falls below the constitutive level associated with no agonists being present in that system. Mm -hmm.